It has 87,000 miles on it. Uh, it's been to a couple different shops for some lean codes. Uh, one shop has replaced an O2 sensor. Another shop has replaced a valve cover gasket and some turbo hoses. And we are just trying to get down to the bottom of why the check engine light is coming on. And ultimately, the owner needs a smog. The car passed smog because the check engine light is currently now off. Uh, but her com the owner's complaint is that when she drives from here, which is San Diego, up to San Jose, which is roughly 500 miles away, the light might go on and the light might go off on the drive between San Diego, San Jose, and back. Um, so right now the light was off. It passed all the monitors. So we got it to pass through smog. So that part's done. So now uh, we're just trying to get into the details of the code, which is like a lean mixture post exhaust system, whatever. I don't know the exact description, but we'll, we'll get into that right here. Uh, so here it is. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Nico. Um, so I, I started the ISTA session um, and, I, and I was going to jump in and do the uh, vehicle test first, but I thought this would be a great time to recap. Um, sorry if I'm looking up because I'm looking at my, my monitor above, but I thought this would be a good time to recap the, uh, the episode that we had where we, uh, we launched into ISTA. So just to get in and, and do a vehicle test and look at faults. So can anyone tell me from this screen, what would be the best path to get in there? This is the speed round. So somebody, anyone, somebody's got to say something. We got to move forward. So, somebody's got to say something. Wh which one? Alex is the one that uses this the most. Which one is it, Alex? Uh, you go to cases to open up. Go to cases to open up a new case. Okay. Um, actually, the the if this is the from from the ISTA session we had. Remember this button right here, the connection manager. So you'd want to go here. It's just forget about the cases unless you're trying to open up an old case. Um, that's that's my recommendation because if there's a if there's a firmware update or if you're about to do programming you want to kind of check and see what your status is on your IP address always launch from the connection manager that's your best bet um, you rather than start a whole session and get through it and then realize that you've got a connection problem incorrect IP address from your connection um, or you can't connect to the icom because it's not plugged in um, or uh, you know the, it needs a firmware update. All of that can be done from right here. So if you go into cases and you try to launch, it'll show you the connection manager. But if there's firmware update required, you can't do it because you're not in the connection manager. The connection manager is a subcategory at that point, right? It's going into cases. So it won't let you do anything to the ICOM, which doesn't seem to be on the network at the moment. <laughs> so um just keep that in mind so right between the print the print button up here at the top and the um and the home button you're gonna see that that connection manager it looks like a D does uh, everybody see where that is it's kind of it's hard to see from the computer screen or yeah. from, from the main screen up there there's um, a it's that button right there yeah right up at the top here i'll, I'll go ahead and close out the connection manager so you can so it's not not a distraction. Let's see. So yeah, from this screen, rather than go to cases, just right here, launch connection manager. Boom. Right there. All right. Um, but we don't have a connection to the icon. Um, bu -bu 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 -bu. Hmm. Are, is it plugged in? It is plugged in. The LAN yep. light is bleaking and the system light is on. Okay. The COM is not on, and the WLAN is not on. Okay, so the COM. Um, how are we connected to the to the uh, computer? Is it through the network, or is it direct? Uh, it's through the network. It's through a switch. Okay. Um, and then the laptop is plugged into the switch. And the switch has a dongle that's plugged oh, into the computer. Okay. Um, 
Let's see here. Let me bring that back up here. We had it work. We had it working yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was working yesterday. All right. Um, let me go ahead and uh, look at your. Are you on? So is the so the computer is connected to Wi-Fi or connected to the LAN? Like what this stuff you mean? Yeah. Let's see. Everything. So you're still connected to Wi-Fi. All right. So you're not connected to the LAN right now. To the LAN. To the. Okay. Yeah, yeah. On the box, um, the LAN, the LAN is lit up. The WLAN is not lit up. Okay. No, but the computer is connected to LAN. All right. It shows unidentified network. Uh, let's turn this one off. I can try disconnecting it and plugging it straight in to the USB or, you know, right into the laptop. I know we've done it. We've kind of done it both ways in the past. Yeah, you should be picking up internet from this uh, from this unidentified network, right? But it's it's so it says unidentified network, but it's not that it, it went, you sh if you were connected to the internet, it would actually have it wouldn't be an unidentified network. So it's kind of something's up with your switch. So I'm gonna stop pushing the Wi-Fi disconnect because that, it's gonna kick me out. Let's just go direct then. Um, we can, we're not doing any program. We're not doing any programming, so um, there won't be an issue. So if we were going to program, we'd need to be through the network. Okay, so I'll just dis so I'll disconnect the ICOM from the switch, and then plug it right into the the dongle on the USB on the laptop. Curve, and it just lit up. The little dongle just illuminated. Okay, cool. So, so it wasn't lit up before, or no? Uh, it was lit up before. I think it was. Lit up. I didn't really look switch. at it. Okay. So that switch might not be connected to the network, and so you had probably a an automatic private inter, uh, um, uh, internet connection or uh, API uh, automatic way. private IP addressing system. Just to let's see. Back. I hope I didn't. I probably disconnected myself. Let's we're gonna find out here. So, what do you do, Alex? You disconnect everything and then reconnect it, then it works. What do you disconnect? So, then Alex, when this happens to Alex, he just disconnects everything and then reconnects everything and then it works. Okay, yeah, that's um. And he leaves it connected to the to the network to the network and not he doesn't go direct. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you got some flaky connection then. Um, so no internet on the unidentified network. <clears throat> that was that was really the issue right there, right? And then I tried to. See yeah, it. but okay. So right now I just disconnected the internet from the laptop so i can reconnect it back to how we had it okay before let's try that real quick connect that to that that to that that to that that to that well that's um this needs to go to that which does okay, so this is your internet modem yeah, but then the ICOM also has to go to that. Right, but this one is your internet. So the internet is not going to connect you. Yeah, but then we won't be able to connect to the car with the Ethernet if we do that. I got you. That's that's All why right, that's cool. why the yep. switch is there. All right. that looks like Let's yeah, everything's blinking nicely. Um, except for the com box. Let's just pull this Unplug. thing out. Yeah, unplug the uh, maybe unplug the ICOM and restart it. It might have timed out, which it, it'll usually just sit there and try and connect for a long, 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 long time. But all right, so the system's blinking, the lands on. Okay, but you're not on the internet right now. Um, are we not on the internet? No. So you're back through the switch? So the landline now. 
Yeah, the switch isn't on the internet right now. Hold on. He's yeah, that should that that's so if the switch isn't connected to the router directly, then your setup is basically the same as just plugging the uh the icom directly into the laptop. So we need okay, so we need internet. Click or this. or we just go back to that. We can go direct since we're not programming. We can just go direct and then turn on the Wi-Fi and and roll with. Okay, it. so let's turn Wi-Fi on. But uh, this cart moves um, around, correct? Manually turn it on, 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 on. How do you turn the Wi-Fi on? There's no internet. I don't know why it's on either because he's on he's on team viewer yeah still not connected it has to have internet is he still able to, connect to... Is he still able are you still are you still connected to the uh computer with vista right now no uh internet connection okay. dropped and i okay. and i turned off wi-fi thinking it would go over to the lan but so you you can if you still have a LAN connection connected you probably now it's probably taking priority you probably need to disconnect it but you can if you went direct with the icom you could leave it alone yeah okay so let's just go direct with the let's go back to this come on take that off take that off put that there put that there okay so now we need um, Wi-Fi Wi-Fi. This one. Yeah. Connect. Connected. Okay, it's connected. Do you want to try reconnecting to TeamViewer? Yep. If it's yep. Um, I think that session is is uh, is is a bunk session. You want to um, start another team viewer session and throw me a password. Yeah. Team viewer, team viewer, team viewer. I don't know where is it on this computer. Where's two? Top left. Oh, there it is. Get out of here. Does he need another password? Yeah, because it bumped him out and then it resets everything. Not ready. Please check your connection. What window is this from? Vista. Why does this not work? Okay, so you're on you're on Wi-Fi, correct? Yeah, we're on Wi-Fi, internet Wi-Fi. Okay, and then um, you got uh, you got the ICOM coming in through the LAN connection on the computer. Yes. Okay. Um, go ahead and unplug that first. Unplug it. Okay. Yeah, and then so it's not trying to connect there still. Okay. And then open your team viewer. And then open team viewer. It says on the bottom of the team viewer, it says uh, not ready. Please check your connection. <clears throat> yeah, so that's a that's an internet like the issue. I guess. Yeah. Do you really want to exit? We can. Yeah. Let's just exit all this stuff. Restart.
Well, so so if we were working off of the uh, the one hour time frame, <laughs> we're done. Right, which is we're always working on the one hour time frame. This is a, uh, and then I think that's what we we discovered. You know, looking at even using um, when we went to trying to use Otis, and uh, you know, so streamlining of the factory tool setup is is going to be. I think that's going to be moving to the top of the list. We should, this this really should be a pretty seamless transition. So, Alex, can I talk to you for a minute while we're waiting for this thing to boot up? Hello. Hey. Um, so, this cart moves around with the uh, ISTA computer, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you, when you usually aren't using the switch, um, or are you just using the switch and, and just letting it be direct connection through the switch? Um, can you define what the switch is? Okay. So, I'm assuming what you have there is a is like a probably a five port network yeah. switch, you know, hub, if you will. That, that is correct. It, uh, we use the the ICOM connects to the switch, and then from the switch. Okay, the ICOM connects to the switch, and then the the laptop connects to the switch as well. Correct. Through uh, through the LAN connection. Yes. Okay. So normally that and and you usually don't have a. Uh, a LAN cable coming from the router into the switch, correct? Not typically, no. Okay. Yeah. So you, most of the time you're running, it's essentially direct. Even though it's going through that switch, there's they're the only two components on that switch. So um, they'll set up a you know an uh, APIPA, which is an automatic internet uh, protocol or IP uh, addressing. Um, uh, just a, a people uh, a um yeah but so when you when you guys connected you didn't i mean did you just now connect a LAN cable into that switch from the router uh i just connected the so i just i, I just texted you the new team viewer login oh. and pass um, and then after I did that, then I connected the ICOM into the laptop. Okay, perfect. So that should be good to go now. Yeah, it should be. It should be. Yeah, it's. it looks like it's coming, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to connect. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. This is crazy. I don't know what's going on with you guys. Um, all right, let me um, let me close down my side. We'll reopen it again because it's just being a butthead. Doesn't I don't think it's on my side. Uh, while you're doing that, I'm just going to try to open uh, ISTA. And right. see if we can communicate with the car. Yeah. So using using the connection manager at the top. Yeah. Um, here, I'm coming in now. All right. Are so, you in? Almost? Yeah, I'm coming there. I'll be right there. So use the okay. connection manager. You should see your icon show up. I'm I'm not there yet. Okay. I'm going to go to AOS and then. Okay. All right. So we're going to go. I'm going to drag this over here. I'm gonna share the screen. Come back over the window. So that should come up as a shared screen now. We're back to that. All right. Um, let's get this out of here. Just uh.
All right. So looks like it's gonna it's it's gonna work here again. Um, but yeah, we should uh, we should definitely get some either make a, a router connection via wireless. Okay, it's the program. Oh, of course. Now you need an update. Perfect. <laughs> what do you know? All right. So um, this is programming package only. Let's see. Um, do you want to connect the Autel to the vehicle? And we'll look at it with uh, with an aftermarket yeah, tool sure. that'll actually get us some work done while we're updating the ISTA. Yeah. What did it not? It just it just now. asked for yeah. It just now called for an update. So I don't know if the if um, ISTA hadn't been restarted in a couple or like a day or two. So um, once it restarts, it realizes like oh yeah. So here if we launch it again, you can see. And what you've got is the what's available is four four two twenty. How does this turn on? Is it off? So, so it looks like the programming package is not up to date. So they just uh, launched a new programming package. So that's that's fine. We're, we only have to update the programming package, not the whole shebang. So we can do that in the background. Um, okay. Um, and then if you want to give me uh, your team viewer on your your auto, we'll just jump in that way and get something done while we're doing this. Team viewer that goes is it Maxi viewer? No, uh, it's on the it's on the Android um, homepage. So the little home screen with the Android in the peeking yeah. out of it, um, it and the then over to the right you'll see Quick Support. It's a it looks like a Team Viewer emblem with a QS in the corner. Yeah, I know. How do I? I don't know where that homepage, the Android homepage is. The lower left corner. Uh, that's the back arrow. Okay, I see the back arrow. Okay, so you got to get out of the diagnostic. Then you're not in a you're not in a screen that allows you to access the homepage. Or you can just hit the uh, there's a double window button down there. It looks like multiple pages. It's probably the third button over from the left. You see that? Uh, I think. Oh, is it the quick support? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Remotely control is left running. Yep, 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 yep. Activating team viewer. Okay, yeah. I got the ID. I got the ID. Send my ID. Okay, go ahead and give it to me. 1972-936-373. Okay, 1972. From there, Nine, go. Yeah, 936-373. Three seven three. All right. Now I'm going to add another one. Okay, so I'm going to drag this one over on top of our ISTA updating one. Let me just check the update here. All right. All right. Yeah, we got a little bit of time. 38 minutes. So we'll be we'll be done working by the time it's ready. All right. So, boink, and then make that big. All right, Jax, got that? <clears throat> Go standalone. Does it have a stand? Oh, it does. Yeah. All right, everybody can see it. Just double check. 
check. That is it. Okay. Now we're cooking. Okay, so this is a long drive check engine light. Does the customer experience any drivability? No, there's no complaint of drivability. It's just the annoying warning that comes on. Yep. They're driving all the way to San Jose. So it's either a grandmother or a drug runner. Or maybe both. The what? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we should do a fault scan here. All right. And then, so the light stays on when they return? To, I mean, by the time they get back, it's on and it's illuminated and it's not going away. So, sometimes. So, so she's brought it in once in January and the light was on. She brought it in to yesterday and the light was off, but it was on on her trip down a couple weeks ago. All right. And I don't know, sometime between a, the last couple of days, the last five or six days, it's turned itself off. Okay. And then it stored a code because we checked the code yesterday. Uh, is it that DTC right there? Yeah. Oxygen that, and sensor that, before yeah. catalytic converter, mixture control, exhaust gas, after catalytic converter, too lean. Okay, and this is intermittent. All right, so this is uh, this is one of those weird um, oxygen sensor faults where, you know, we, you know, BMW never really emphasized or, or alluded to the fact that they are trimming with the rear sensor. Whereas if you were a Chrysler guy, um, they've been doing that since the neon, right? It's uh, they, you know, because there would be so many exhaust leaks up front, they would go ahead and trim from the rear sensor. Um, but that's kind of what it's indicating right here is we've got an intermittent, the after, after cat or after the, I think we have one after cat monitoring sensor here, um, is is too lean. Right, so it's uh, so we'll take a look at that, and it's intermittent. What else we got going on here? That could also be software related. Um, anytime you see, I mean, if everything checks out here, I would want to look and see what our software level is, and if there's a DME update. Um, and if we were on ISTA, it would be cool. We could just hit the air button and see if there's a related bulletin for this fault. So it's a bummer that ISTA is just being ISTA. Uh, how long do you think ISTA is going to take? Um, it said 38 minutes, so that'll be an hour. Okay. No, I mean, it, it may, your internet connection may be fast enough that it actually delivers in the 38 minutes, but I never hold my breath. Um, All right. But we're, we can we can use what we've got here. Um, single end dollar transmitter. Uh, okay. No message, no message. So we've got some other, we've got some other intermittent stuff going on here too. Look at, we've got, uh, um, accelerator pedal message missing, um, you know, torque, uh, crankshaft torque missing wheel, uh, wheel torque from the powertrain, um, so a lot of missing messages through from DME over CAN. So there's so that kind of changes some stuff too. Um, lots of missing messages all from the DME. All right. Um, what else do we have here? Over temperature, central locking. All right. Um,
what did you say the mileage was? 80 something? Yeah, uh, 87,000. All right. Oh, didn't nothing typed. Come on. I don't know what the heck's going on. Uh, oh, I got to use the keyboard, I guess. Okay, so we saved it. Let's go and look at our. So, what, what, who, somebody call out what we're going to do next. We looked at all the faults. What are we going to do next? Go to go to mo, go to uh, uh, mode six. Free, free, thank you. Freeze frame. Freeze Felipe frame. Freeze frame. Cool, Felipe, you're on it. Thank you. Control units, drive. DME should be able to see faults here with freeze frame. Okay, so we've got a little little snowflake here because it's just a unique scenario. Like, you know, we're all snowflakes, but this one is uh, this wasn't some actually important. We'll take a look at it, and see what's happening here. Um, integration. Uh, Lambda control after the catalytic converter is zero. So it's actually going all the way to zero. And and from our from our um, testing with oxygen sensors in the in past um, episodes, does the does the rear or do do any of the sensors actually ever go to to zero? Um, unless they go like open like open loop. Well well open loop would probably be if yeah, I guess that would be the case if it was if it was complete circuit it'd be zero this is an integration of zero so it could actually go positive or negative but our voltage you know would never go to zero but that's interesting it's it's at zero that would tell you it's not it's not trimming or adding where's our does it show us a voltage it doesn't give us a voltage happens nine times it just happened or it's currently present right so that is the the is the mill on right now no it is not Okay, but it happened on the last trip. Does everyone remember the the healing counter? What that's all about? So an OBD two regulation. I think this we did this in like the first episode, maybe second episode. Noah Noah just said forty key cycles. Um, forty key cycles or really trips. You know, um, key cycles on some faults will uh, will count because the enable criteria is not as rigorous. But with oxygen sensors, we're going to have to have a warm up phase. And so there's going to be like probably about five minutes of, of operating time before it actually would be considered a trip and the healing counter count down. Um, if, the, if the fault isn't present, the next time it's tested and the enable criteria are met, then it'll go ahead and reduce that by one and it'll count down all the way to 40. And if it doesn't happen again inside of 40 trips, then the, then the DME can clear it itself. Um, it just purges it from, and it's not there. Uh, so it's, it's, it's either we haven't met the enable criteria or it's, it just happened. So we've got a P2096. That's something we want to just uh, keep that in mind with the PO, the P2906, because if, if things get super crazy, we can go to the engineering data and look up that fault and see what the enable criteria is for that fault. If we need to know exactly what components are involved with, with the setting of this light and what the enable criteria are, what are the parameters that it's setting the fault for? Um, but we know that uh, the, we've got, um, what else do we have here? We have ambient temperature. So a little chilly. So that's, not this is a more happy morning it hasn't been 55 degrees here in a in a minute hmm i don't i think he was trying to share the so share the hotel the screen is it is are you guys seeing it oh uh, we're, we're, we're watching it on the we're watching the hotel device Oh, okay. Um, uh, I think I'm sharing. I should be sharing that, right, Jax? It's it, it's all good. Keep on going. We're, yeah. We're, if we're if uh, 
I made it big on this other screen. So, oh, wait, you know what? Here, let me make it big over here now. Um, is that better, Jax? I don't know if you can. He should be able to share that with you guys. Um, right. we're, we have the, do we have the, are you looking at the ISTA on the other screen? Yeah, there's hmm. ISTA. So I'm, I'm on top of that. Uh, let me see. I, I share, let me, I may, maybe I'm not sharing that one. Hold on. Let me share. Oh, I, that's what it is. I'm only sharing the, I'm sharing the ISTA screen. So that's my bad. All right. I got it. I got it. I got it. Sorry about that. Window. And I want, this is the Autel. There we go. Now, you guys got that now? There you go. There it is. Yep. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. I, I thought, oh, I, I thought I'm sharing the screen. I'm looking at the same monitor. And I'm thinking you guys are seeing both sessions on the, because I'm looking at them on the same monitor. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's all good. Um, okay. So ambient pressure um looks reasonable it's, it's you know it's, it's one bar outside so um and it happened time after or time after end of starting 655 seconds so it's what uh 10 minutes ish right this is 60 seconds if we divide that by 60 um yeah that's about somewhere in 10 10 minutes or so so um so 54 degrees and um, 10 minutes and yeah, there's not a lot of, unfortunately, there's lot, not a lot of information in this uh, freeze frame. You know, we don't know what the, what the calculated load was. Oh, hey, there we go. What's going on here? Ah, didn't, I'm having some issues with this mouse. All right. This is, oh, so this is the, this is the event before the last event. But yeah, we're not seeing anything that gives us some data to reproduce the conditions, right? So we don't see um, engine temperature, um, calculated load, uh, if there's any speed related, right? Um, but we do have that that temperature. Let's look at the temperature on these other ones and just see if there's a if there's a correlation there uh felipe is saying go to the generic side of the hotel instead yeah. of bmw yeah no i would agree um so on the generic side it's required to give you that information okay so let's um we'll escape out of here all right we don't have ista up right now uh, but one of the cool things you know because this is kind of nice it, if if we had it up, you could push the air button in the upper right corner and see if there's a related bulletin. Well, Autel is pretty good about doing this. They'll stick these little um, help buttons over here, and they may have they may reference this to a specific bulletin as well. So that's that. Don't overlook this uh, this little help uh, icon over here. It it can get you uh, it can get you the answer pretty quickly if it says, oh, there's a known issue with this you know software update or you know look at this component so um so the diagnosis monitor monitor what monitors whether the oxygen sensor after the catalytic converter shows a permanent deviation um the fault monitoring conditions the fault is detected whenever the oxygen sensor emissions control after the catalytic converter is positively exceeds uh, a value of 4%. Okay, so this we've got a standard rear, um, you know, standard um, zirconia oxygen sensor, and it is a zero to one volt scale. So that, you know, 450 millivolts, anytime it exceeds, you know, 4% off of 450 millivolts, it's considered active. So that's when it's, that's when it's gonna uh, set. So anytime the rear sensor is uh, active, Basically, um, the catalytic converter temperature greater than 500 degrees C, which is uh, estimated by a, a map because there's no actual temperature there. Um, uh, constant exhaust flow greater than 50 kilograms per hour, and that's based on uh, the air mass um, calculation, right? So, and other preconditions speed between 50 and 80 kilometers an hour 
with a medium engine load, 1,200 to 3,000. Okay, so, so we've got some, this is this is our enable criteria here. So these are things that we would consider, you know, like, all right, so it's got to be cruising um, and, you know, and at operating temperature. And of course, obviously the engine's got, the ignition's got to be on, terminal 15 on. That would, might have been one to put at the top. Um, okay, so the fault influence, higher fuel consumption. Oh, that's probably what they're bumming about going to San Jose. <clears throat> the uh, rough engine running, which we did not get a concern with, increased emissions values potentially uh, and the mill. That's so higher fuel consumption in the mill is probably what, what's going on. All right. Um, so things to look at. Tank ventilation system, um, variable cam timing control, ignition, injection, crankshaft sensor, camshaft sensor. So basically, you know, it runs through like, hey, start at the tank vent system, which could affect you know, fuel trims. Um, and then from there, check everything else. Um, that, that's the long and short of that. All right. So... Remember, we're, we're making a plan, but we're going to go a little bit beyond just making a plan. We're going to try and take a look at a couple of things. So let's, um, let's escape out of here. Let's go look at the, let's look at the live data. I got to get escape, yeah, escape, escape, escape. Anybody have any thoughts? No. Okay, crickets. All right, got it. Uh, you want to? Um, are we able to start this car? No, no, no. Has a thought. Okay, let me hear it. No. Um, just out of curiosity, since another shop did the O2 sensor, if they replaced the right or the correct O2 sensor. Yeah, which one did they install? And they put one in. Yeah. They've got you know they've got a 50-50 shot on that, right? Exactly. Yeah. And just can't trust another shop. Oh, don't go there, man! Come on. Yeah. <laughs> We're brothers. The, uh, We're brothers. The, the uh we did i did find the part number that the other shop replaced so it could be uh we could go check that that's a, that's a good thing to always check yeah well i think yeah, that's no good, idea that's a good uh task for noah because he's he's uh, so distrustful he's the one who said it yeah that's right um <laughs> well had he been so like well you know we don't know and he could have been a little more brotherly about that but now you get to do some work <laughs> don't, don't put down another shop don't be you don't want them to do that to you you know it's like it's not hard to pick apart some work um that especially if it was unsuccessful repair uh so keep that in mind do you want to be on the other end of that all right so can we get this car started yep it is running now cool all right and um so we've got uh we've got about 10 minutes max uh, but so so far we know that um we know that the enable criteria based on the the information that autel has put in there again i'd want to double check that against um what uh ista says with the enable criteria not to say that autel's information is uh not correct but sometimes there's you know there's some deviation um you know so i just uh rather than get figure that out further down i'd just like to at least double check it um we're going to look at some live data and just see if we can because we we did some testing oh you know what <sighs> sorry um can i get you to turn that off again and just key on again i'm sorry I forgot to do step one our, our simplest simplest test i got i got too excited all right here so step one right key on engine off we're going to just double check you know since this is technically related to an air, you know, the air mass uh, of the exhaust and fuel trim, you know, a fuel trim trim, trimming sensor. We should just verify that our, our uh, pressure sensors are valid, right? So, um, ba -ba -ba. oh, you guys, that's right. You guys are... Um, Fahrenheit guys, I'm gonna do this to you. Okay, 
Oh, there. That that makes sense. All right. Okay. So ambient pressure got some high pressure today. It's uh, one uh, thousand fourteen. Right. So let's just go and find our intake charge pressure. So ten seventeen. So that's before the throttle and after. We got ten ten thirteen. Right. Or that's the nominal value. That's what it's shooting for. So. These are within a couple of millibar of each other. All right, so these are plausible. So we can take those, we can essentially take those out of the equation. Um, and and temp, intake temperature, 31. And, all right. Okay, now we can start it. Fired up. But those are the, I mean, that one right there, that's just a, an easy gimme that, Sometimes it just hands it to you. You know, you're like, ha, huh, there we go. We're good. And you're able to salvage that one hour diagnosis uh, in, in just a matter of moments. But we weren't that lucky today. So don't buy lottery tickets today. All right. So we're in warm up phase, right? So we've got uh, target speed. It's coming down. So we should start seeing this air mass value coming down. Anybody give me a nominal value, what we're expecting to see when we get to around 700 RPM at idle? Okay. Kind of where we're at now, I'd say somewhere between 12 and 16-ish, right? Um, that's what I would want to see. So it's, uh, it's getting there. That seems like a big range. Um, but I, I want to see somewhere around a volt. If we were looking at a conventional air mass meter and I was looking at the voltage, I want to see somewhere like between 0 0.7, 0 0.9. One volt would be like a hot rod air mass meter. But, um, you know, just for future reference. But these are probably frequency now. So that's not super helpful. But, yeah. All right. So that's a that air mass values. You know, pretty reasonable. That's what I would. That's what I would expect to see. On the lowest end would be 12. You know, and and at, at warmed up idle, I'd want to see somewhere around, you know, 16 ish, which we're right there. Um, that's good. So we're we're warming up to the point where we should be able to start looking at the oxygen sensors. Hey, Noah, any, any luck on that, uh, which sensor they installed? No, 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 no's over here dozing off. Oh, dude, sleeping on the job. Just here, hold on. on. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, that'd be good. Thank you. All right. It so, is... so it did say something about the, uh, Cam timing, so which part number they changed is this right here. All right, we're in Valvetronic mode. Um, 40 liters an hour. That's uh, and they call that the pre cat O2 okay. sensor. So, pre cat. Let's just... So, they, they did the front one, yes. Yeah, we're okay, right? yeah. Well, we're having codes for the rear ones, but go verify with a flashlight if you can see the front O2 sensor, if it's actually the front O2 sensor. But so now, now Noah's uh, condemnation of the other workshop is valid. <laughs> but, you know. It, it, it appears to be new. It looks new. Okay, yeah, so the front. Okay. Okay. So it okay. is it is new. We're gonna verify that it's the correct part number. Okay, so the rear one looks old. All right. Okay, and then if you look here, we've got this uh the tank vent, because that was one of the things it wanted us to look at. We don't have any EVAP faults, and tank ventilation at idle is at 30%, which is pretty normal. Um, so it's not like it's over venting. Now, if we had an issue with the um with the vent valve sticking one way, either closed or open, then I would expect that there would also be an EVAP system fault in there. Um, just, just saying, um, 
you know, you want you still want to keep that that recommendation of where to start that diagnosis in the back pocket, but we're already setting up and seeing some of the values, the nominal values don't really indicate that that's an issue. Um, and, and the fault code is just the one fault code. So yeah. if we start getting nowhere, that might be something to revisit, but right now and the rough run, I don't really see a rough run happening here. Um, so, oh, there's cylinder one got a little crazy there, but not much. Oh, now cylinder two. So, anybody tell me what a negative value indicates? Is there anybody there that's ne negative? Is this, like, is this like reading teams? Like Every, uh, everybody's looking at it. Here, here, winner wants to say something. Okay, winner. Uh, the, the crankshaft's slowing down, right? It's speeding up. Speeding up? At negative values speeding negative up? Values. Correct. You're going to have to explain that one. I know. I knew I would. Okay. So this is, this is, you're exactly correct. This is monitoring the crankshaft speed, right? So this is the, the, and it's, it is the, based on the adaptation. So if it is adding... So it's adding that adaptation. That means that crankshaft's slowing down. So it has to add a little more time, right? right. And then if it's speeding up, if there if the cylinder is contributing, there's you know the power strokes functioning correctly, then it's speed the crankshaft speeds up. It has to take away a little bit of time. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like three times. So don't get all excited about negative numbers. Negative numbers are good. Positive numbers are bad. So right there, number two, did you see that positive two? So a little, little roughness happening, it, but it's, um, this is a four cylinder. So there's going to be every once in a while, you'll get cylinders just kind of loading up and they will clear out with a, with a positive number. And you know, anything like 1.2 right there, that you probably felt a little stumble. You're probably not going to feel much. Anything over one, um, is, is an event that is, you know, should be should be looked at um so cylinder four was sitting there at a positive value for a minute but if the thing's sitting here idling so it and it's a four cylinder so it's going to load up a little bit even though it's you know emissions optimized and it shouldn't really load up right um because it's direct injected there's there's going to be some some you know build up you know some some residual uh unburned fuel that um will eventually you know cause issue and, and essentially clear out or um you know it could be even you know just a, a, a minor ceiling issue i mean it, it's but none of this looks exciting at all this looks fairly normal it's what i would expect um now if you had a cylinder that was constantly sitting above one and then moving into you know uh positive two positive three um you know positive four it's 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 almost it feels like it's almost a dead miss, right? Six and seven, it's it's kind of out of the game, and then, and then from there you'll watch it increase rapidly. But right now this is this is all pretty pretty normal. But negative numbers are good, positive numbers are bad. All right. Oh, just that's right. This doesn't work. All right, let's get let's keep on moving here. See what we got going on. No misfires. Tapping noise, knock signals. Let's get to our, we should be able to see. All right, so we're at 90 degrees C, so that's a operating temperature. This vehicle is going to run anywhere from 90 to 110 degrees C. Uh, but that's the radiator outlet temperature. So we should actually be in, in above 100 here, right? In coolant temperature up top. Okay, so this is our ratio sensor voltage 1.46 and then downstream sensor voltage all right so let's let's look at this for a minute and oh there's our fuel trim so we're multiplicative fuel trim it's just along you know both additive and multiplicative are really long-term adaptations um so don't don't get don't try and classify them as anything anything else they don't really fit the model um 
for short term, long term. But multiplicative is um, they took away the additive, but they're giving us multiplicative, and that's going to be a correction by um, by percentage across the entire range. So one point one point one one correction across the range adding. That's great. I mean, that's there's nothing to get excited about there. But let's look. We're going to pull up our voltages here. We're going to show the selected. We'll merge this graph. And we'll do some of the uh, quick and dirty um, O2 sensor tests that we talked about when we when we dove into um, O2 sensors, right? Um, so what's going to happen? How would we test the the reaction or, or you know and verify that this these sensors are actually able to um, respond and and report consistently from what we would expect to see right we we, we kind of expect the rear sensor to sit at 0. 0.6 or 0. 0.7 all the time if it wants to sit at 0. 0.8 and there's no fault then it, the dme is commanding it to run at 0. 0.8 um but historically it's around 0. 0.7 volts um and that's that's what we've got right here this uh this front sensor this looks like it's you know it's a um i think the the target is probably uh it's a one five if if, if you ask me i would say it's a one five so i would expect to see 1.5 volts constantly but here it's sitting at 1.46 um but we don't really have an indication that we have a uh, a lean condition um our air mass value you know they they did a valve cover gasket oh that's cool but what about crankcase pressure how would we determine if there might be a, an issue with crankcase pressure um with the scan data our our um our air mass value was was at 16 right at warm idle and then we can go back and revisit it here in a minute and just see where it's at now if we had an internal vacuum leak pcv issue that's going to pull the air mass value lower so that's where you start to see it move toward the 12 side and anything in, anything below 12 um, is going to indicate that we're probably got something going on internally so a pcv issue um but we didn't i didn't really see that right now so and the, and the numbers we're seeing right now look pretty normal can somebody give me a test I asked it a minute ago. I was thinking, I was hoping you guys would hear that and then start racing to stick your hands up and give me a test that we're going to do right now, quick and dirty, to just watch the performance of these sensors. Okay, not everybody talk at once. Come on. Somebody, somebody, somebody. What? All right. Well, uh, uh, it's uh i'll tell you when we run the car it's really hard to hear you because the speakers on the other side of the car we got to figure out oh. how to do that part so was, but is my microphone better this gets, time? no it's it's not the, it's it's like a it's a it's a volume problem on our end because okay. the engine overruns the, the okay. amount the volume all amount. right so um my question is do we have a quick and dirty test so we can watch the performance of these these oxygen sensors if we wanted to go back and look at the the um graph that we've got going on here what can we do to just look at the performance i don't know like raise the engine rpm exactly we could just punch it wide open throttle and we should yeah. we would expect to see an increase in fuel and then when we let off we would see a, a fuel cutoff so we should see the entire range right there right Oh, okay, just, yeah, just, just that like easy. Like the whole. Felipe was saying, make create a vacuum leak. Right. But then we're, what you're saying is like do the entire range, which is like snap yeah. the throttle, enrich in the mixture, and then when you let off, it cuts the fuel, so then it goes full lean. Yeah, and that way we're looking at both yeah. the front and the rear doing that, and the same thing would happen with Felipe is 100 percent correct. If we wanted to look at the uh, response of the front sensor, you create a huge vacuum leak. And it should shift and then come right back to this 1.46, 1.48 range that it sits at. But it should move and then the voltage come back and sit steady. And then after a few moments, we will see that that increase of oxygen push through the catalyst and the rear sensor would respond as long as we had that, that leak active. 
So that's what we would expect. But just a quick and dirty, like, just like punch it and let go. And then um, let's record it. Okay, got it, got it, got it. All right, so so do that, Alex. There it is. Hmm. Well, that's um, it's a little little crazy. That uh, that front sensor really just did not get right back to where it thought it should be. That very fast that was kind of hmm all right so i stopped the recording we'll go back and review this for a minute let's just see what happened here yep, let's watch that all right um we are gonna select uh, dun, 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 uh, these guys right here and we are gonna go to oh show select Okay. All right. So we should be able to move this around here. Okay. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, we just shut the car off so we could hear you better. Okay. This is uh this should be a recording though. Correct. All right. So I'm not seeing, not seeing what happened here. Am I off the scale? Oh, it's a six minute. Oh, Noah said the very, look at the very end. Oh yeah, it's six minutes. Yeah, I guess I was talking for so much for that one hour. Eric's got six minute questions. Never gonna get through this. Oh, here we go. There it is. All right. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. So we see it. Look at that range though. It only the So it only went up to 0.8. Right, so that was the punch through. It's sitting at 0.7. It only went up to 0.8. And then it dropped all the way to zero. Right? Um, where are we at here? This is uh, 0 0.03. So it's not 100%, but that's that's interesting. It, should ha it shouldn't hit a full zero. Um, and then what do we have here? We had... But it didn't really, it did not, doesn't look like it really threw a lot of fuel in there. We might not have hit that thing for very long. Let's see. Might want to get a little more fuel in there. That thing stayed low for a long time. And then it, it bounced up to 0.8. So not a lot of rich punch through, but a lot of lean punch through. And it stayed for a long time, but our it took a long time for the front to respond as well. Now, things to keep in mind: these values look like live values, and for the most part, they are. Um, but they are processed. We're asking the DME to give us the data as it sees it after processing it, right? So can the scan tool data be, you know, off if we had a software error with the DME or, you know, poor software calculation? Yeah, that's, it's, um, that is a, a thought that just usually, usually you start thinking software when um, you've had an undervoltage situation and there's a bunch of undervoltage faults in the whole car and you're through your diagnosis and things just don't seem to add up there's there's a, a a logic mismatch into the fault and to the to the actual values that's when you start thinking oh we've had an undervoltage situation that's when software errors occur um you know it's very possible to just need to reload the software even if there's not an update available we saw no undervoltage situation so we don't believe I don't believe that it's a software error created from outside influence, but there may be an adaptation issue, long-term adaptation issue that we're looking at. But um, 
and this is processed data, but you know that that rear sensor going all the way to zero is somewhat concerning because you, there's always going to be a buffer of at least a hundred millivolts because that's the that's the uh, it leaves the cush the the buffer for the DME to to calculate whether or not we have a short to ground, right? It'll never go all the way to zero because there's going to be that buffer. And if it does go to zero, the DME can say, oh, there's a short to ground. And it's never going to go above one volt on the, on the rear sensor. Um, and it usually sits around somewhere around, you know, 950 millivolts-ish, you know, 980-ish at the max. <clears throat> if it goes to one volt or higher, then the DME can set a fault for sensor short to B+. plus. So that just... Based on that, I'm a little concerned about that all you know that sensor going all the way to zero. The other thing that, that is interesting is that the front sensor we expect it to to move in the direction of the uh, of the condition, right? Whether it be rich and then lean, move there, but then rapidly come back and sit, right? That's the that's the correction of the pump cell. You know, the current being applied to the pump cell to, you know, exchange oxygen in that pump cell to get back to a zero state, right? That's what that wideband sensor does. And this front sensor seems just as laggy as a standard uh, oxygen sensor. So that's kind of, that's also kind of interesting. But again, we're looking at process data. Um, so, so that's my observation on that um i would say felipe's uh, uh choice right now is probably another a good one to do since we're looking at that sensor hitting zero um a large vacuum leak will then do one more test of a different type you know you know instead of a rich and lean together combo we'll just focus on lean and the fault was indicating that we had a lean bias to this rear sensor um and this it may be that's what it, this is it's not there long enough to con be considered a short to ground but that might be the the cause of this this fault um so you guys you're probably got to get to work but um and we should if we were running a one hour if we're on the one hour time frame that's it we're done um, you know, thanks to ISTA, we lost a good 20 minutes of diagnostic time, but uh, we're going to sell additional time anyway, right? We're going to we note our observations, uh, the fault areas, you know, the enable criteria for that fault, look at the freeze frame data. We're not clearing anything yet. We look at the OBD2 freeze frame data just to look at the driving conditions. But we have an idea of what those driving conditions are. It's going to be, um, you know, somewhere between uh, 50 to 80 kilometers an hour at, you know, 12 to 1300 RPM up to 3000. Um, and we definitely see some, some wackiness, I would say in the rear sensor response going all the way to zero. Now we're not going to, we're not going to pull a, a fast one like that other shop and just huck a sensor at it. Hail Mary. We'd like to get a little more information just to fortify our, our diagnosis and then make sure that we're not going to get, you know, caught by some other, you know, lurking potential issue. Um, you know, this, these responses are not, not ideal to say the least. Um, not what I would expect. So if you guys wanted to do quick, open the cap and make a big old vacuum leak, we could do that too. Sure, you mean the uh, the oil fill cap? Yeah. It. You're talking about the oil fill cap? Yeah. This is yeah. a giant vacuum leak. All right. Yeah. F fire it up. Take it off. All right. Don't let oil fly everywhere. Just put oh, your yeah, hand there. Oh yeah. Keep it cold. Right. Okay. So that's.
That's about right. Yeah, well, all the way back down to zero. It did. And now look where it's sitting. I mean, it's sitting just above zero, but um, not much above zero. <laughs> and all right, so go ahead and uh, go ahead and throw that cap back on there. I'm happy with the uh, the response of the front sensor, though it did it did react and then come back up and and make an adjustment. But it seems to like when you it's good for a lean condition, but man, for for coming back to normal, it's uh it's a little a little slow. So it's that it's that rich cycle that kind of weirds it out. Um, all right, that rear sensor responded pretty quickly to the to the cap being put back on. Now it's sitting. All right, so let's uh, let's see. So let's review the second one here. Let's get over to. Oh, is that 17 minutes? Are you kidding me? Um, a minute ago. All right. Oh, so it, it it took a it took a while back. All right. We'll just we'll just get to the end of this one. Let's just look at that look at that sensor again. And it stayed low for a long time. It stayed at zero for a long time. And so, well, all right. So here it's above zero. Uh, okay, so that's at the line. Oh, come on, that's way too much. Come on, right there, right here. Oh, okay. Um, let me just scoot it back just a hair. All right. So for almost three seconds, it stayed at zero, right? Point one is kind of where I would expect to see it. The, um, the front sensor took a dip a little bit, but then stayed right, right in there, right? Got right back to where it's supposed to be. So that makes me feel better about that front sensor. Also makes me feel a little bit better about software possibility, but this, you know, staying, this should be hovering above zero, not at zero. Um, could that be a bad I, I wonder if it's actually getting into the negative number. Well, if we had a negative number, I would say we definitely have a sensor issue for sure. But I, I wonder if the screen can read negative. Um, yeah, it, it will. It'll, it will it'll yeah. shift. Yeah, it'll shift. The scale should shift automatically. Um, let's see. Let's make this. I think it'll actually make a bigger. You can actually move this. I think. All right? Can you? Uh, I can't move it right now. When it's um, when you're measuring, you can actually move the the measurements. I think to show different scale, right? And it'll automatically. It should automatically, you know, shift to capture the entire range. Um, because so, they're independent, so you know the the range will will adjust automatically. Um, but yeah, that this thing was in the negative numbers for sure. I mean, there's there's it's a it's a sensor for sure, and I'm kind of leaning for it's a sensor right now because of it's going all the way to zero. Um, but the concerning thing is that the the DME isn't faulting for that. That's the but it, it might not be there long enough to be considered a short, right? So plausibility wise, this is not a short because shorts happen and, and you know, they stay um, you know, for a lot longer than three seconds sometimes you would expect. So that might be why we're getting this default variant that we're getting is that it's biased lean, but it's staying low. So probably during fuel cutoff when they're driving, um, you know, they're, they're coming down the hill, right? And they let off the fuel and then it does fuel cut off and this thing pegs and sits there at zero volts for, you know, probably four to five seconds or so before it starts injection again. 
and enough of that is probably happening that it's it sets the fault for this for the 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 bias condition so so if we were so if we were to say deem that that rear o2 sensor is bad the post test would be the same thing where we rev it up and then watch it go down to a, a, a voltage and ideally it doesn't go down to zero. Yeah, that, that'd be exactly, you know, whatever, um, th that's the litmus test, right? So whatever you are condemning the component on, um, you want to come back and run that exact same test again uh, as part of the verification. Um, so, and that's, that's where your notes are really important. If you've got a QC guy, they need to know what test you ran so that they can do the same thing, right? Cause they, you can't just, you know, put the sensor in and say, okay, I think we got it. You know, there was no faults. Um, you know, we want to run this exact same test again at operating temperature, go through, look at your, look at your values, see if anything changed um, trim wise from the rear sensor affecting the, the forward trim. Um, yeah, Cause it, everybody doesn't talk about them doing it, but they do use a rear sensor as a trimming uh, O2 sensor, which is, they started doing that with mini, um, you know, more so than, than BMW, but you know, I, you know, that now they're, they're essentially the same, they're running the same engine platforms, everything. So, um, yeah, I would hey, should, say, should we run, should we run through, uh, these guys got to get back to, yeah, they do to work. Should we just run through this ISTA right now? Cause yeah. it said it, it says it's completed. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and, then, and, uh, and switch. Then, uh, see if there's an update. And if not, then condemn yes. a rear O2. Based on what I'm seeing right here, that's, that's the call I would make if I had to make a call right now. Um, okay. Share screen. I'm going to grab, grab a window here. Let's go look at the ISTA window. Boink. Okay. Share that. Okay. Um, we're gonna oh we did we didn't unpack it all righty anybody have any questions on this stuff anybody throw in any other tests questions tests yeah i don't, I don't know what's that what's but that no was asking what the front o2 may have looked like before they replaced it I don't think they even know. I can't. I yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you, were, you were right. I was like, you were right. They have a rear two code, and they replaced the front sensor. I was like, why did they yeah, do that? Right. What did they see with the front sensor that was lazy? Yeah. Right. You know, they, there's a very good chance that they saw exactly what we just saw, and they did the same, like, quick and dirty tests, and, they, and that front sensor was not coming back to that center, you know, to right on the, the median voltage, like it, we yes. would expect it to. And that's part, they may have based their replacement of the front sensor off of that test, which, you know, in that case, you can't really fault them that much because I'm not really liking the way that, that that thing responds to, you know, on the lean side, if we do just the vacuum leak, it responded pretty good. It dripped, it dipped down and it got right back to where it started pretty quickly. Right? And that's what you would expect to see. But on the rich side, it it went up and then it kind of took a while. You know, so kind of a weird response. So you can't, based on that, you can't really, if that's what they based their diagnosis on, I wish they would have gone a little further with that diagnosis before condemning it. But, you know, that, that that's entirely valid. It does not, it's not ideal. And we can see if we have another N20 here right now to see if it does, if it acts the same. Yeah, definitely look at, uh, look at, a, look at a vehicle. Um, any, you know, that Mercedes that we were working on, look at that one, you know. Oh, you're out of disk space. Oh. On what? Oh, on this thing? Yeah. You got to free some up. So you got to, you got to um, unload all your, all your, ripped the cds you put them onto a hard drive you got all your cds yeah i don't have any 
I don't have any CDs on there. All your uh, all your wave files. Um. So we can we can continue this. I'll I'll continue looking at this. You guys get to work. We'll uh, and when I pull it up, we can um you know take some screenshots and share. But uh, I'll, I'll work out your disk space and uh, um, see if we can't get this thing to load um, and 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 run and see if there's a software update. But yeah, um, yeah, I wonder if the, you know that's a good question though. If they replace the front sensor because of that, uh, because of that response, and then if they did and they didn't see a you know they didn't retest it to say oh man. Yeah, we got to scramble. All right, well, well, thank you, Eric. Everybody's kind of disappearing here. Let's wave bye to Eric. Yeah, yeah. Eric. See you guys. Hey, don't don't don't, don't, let me, don't let me go. Just cut me out of this. Cut me out of the show, and I'll keep working on this. No, the uh, you want me to plug the ISTA in? Um, or it, no? It is. Oh, um, well, I'm just trying to get some free space on the on the hard. Or drive. I mean the icon. 